Erin, thank you so much for joining us. Uh, I am, of course, speaking to the lovely Erin Antrada Kelly, who has come to Story Mastermind to talk about something very important, timely, and uh, vital to the bigger publishing discussion today. Thank you so much for joining us and for your time. Thank you for having me. Of course. My absolute pleasure. Um, so what I wanted to talk to you about today, and we may range kind of all over the place, but this, this idea that we have of there's this, <laughs> so two poles of, of thought. One is write what you know um, in terms of, how the writer positions their experience or somebody else's experience on the page. And the other extreme would be, well, fiction exists to get us into different shoes, into different experiences. So we could be anyone in fiction. We could represent anyone in fiction. And we're having a lot of discussion about what that means um, when writers want to write outside of their lived experience, whether that's race or um, neurotypicity, uh, anything, anything really that kind of takes us out of our lane, quote unquote. What say you? So you wrote Hello Universe, which takes several different points of view. Uh, and some of them, I would imagine, are not necessarily lived experience for you. So I obviously thought of you for this, this conversation. What do you say just trying to dissect this really big topic? So, I mean, I think you said it. It's a really big topic, and it's so <laughs> complex. It's much more complex than I think people realize. And, you know, I teach in the, the graduate publishing program at Rosemont College in Philadelphia, and one of the courses I teach is contemporary issues in children's, you know, probably half of the semester talking about this issue and how it relates to all kinds of different facets of the industry. So it's such a big issue that I, and I know, you know, we can't, can't necessarily unpack it in this short period of time, yeah. but I'll kind of give you as, as much uh, perspective as I can in the time that we have. So um, I have a lot of thoughts and feelings on this and, um, I'm somewhere in the middle of those two poles, but with different caveats, right? So in Hello Universe, uh, I have four point of view characters. And kind of the one that takes up the most space is Virgil uh, Salinas, who is a Filipino American boy. So that is considered own voices, right? Because I'm Filipino American. Um, and then we have Valencia, who is a girl who is deaf which is not my lived experience. I'm a hearing person. And then we have Kegori Tanaka, who's Japanese American. And then we have uh, Chet Bolins, who's uh, kind of like the neighborhood bully. Um, and so these are my thoughts. I wanted to write a book about Virgil and a shy, quiet, scared, sensitive boy. And and the people around him in his world, which includes Valencia, who's the girl that he has a crush on and wishes he could speak to, and Kaori, who is his, kind of his only friend and is a, a fortune teller, and she's 12. So in my mind, when I think of Hello Universe, you know, if someone were to ask me, is this an own voices book? My immediate thought is yes, because it's a story about Virgil, because in my mind, he's kind of the main impetus. But then we have Valencia, right? And Valencia is deaf. She wears hearing aids. Um, she lip reads or speak reads. And these are all experiences that I did not have. Um, and I knew very little about when I set out to write the book. So if I were to write a book about Valencia in which it centered her experience as a deaf girl, mm -hmm. I think that's a book that I would not have written. And what I mean by that is the book is not about Valencia being deaf and what is it like to be a girl who is deaf. She's a character in the book who happens to be deaf. And I think that that is a, you know, it's, it's kind of difficult to explain maybe eloquently but what I mean, but the story is not about Valencia being deaf. 
right? She happens to be deaf. Yeah. Um, I would not write a book, per- me personally, about a girl who is deaf, and, and that's what the book is about, only because I would be uncomfortable. That's so far outside my lived experiences that I, would, I wouldn't be certain how to navigate all the nuances if that's what the story is about. But this book is very much about Virgil and the people in his universe, no pun intended. So <laughs> one thing, though, that I did keep in mind is I was very aware even before I started writing Hello Universe, um, that there is an authenticity question or issue and that this dialogue was happening in publishing. And now, now it has ratcheted up exponentially, but even then it was a very important dialogue topic. So I knew that if I was going to write this character, I had to be aware that I would be held accountable in a way that an author who is deaf or hard of hearing would not be. They're still held accountable, even if you're writing in your own lane, so to speak, you're still held accountable. But if you're writing outside your, your lane, you're, you're held to a higher standard, as you should be, by the way. So I knew that I would be more scrutinized. So with all this in mind, there was a period of time when I thought, you know what, I'm just forget it. I'm just going to make Valencia hearing. I don't want to make a mistake. I don't want to, I don't want to disrespect anyone. And it wasn't me, me being like, well, fine, I just won't write about it then. It was more like I, I legitimately did not want to want to upset a community that, that I wanted to uh, respect, right? Uh, and, and damage. Contrast within, there's already controversy within the deaf community. Yes. As to how, you know, if, if you get cochlear implants, for example, you know, are you still a part of the community? So it, there are so many layers that you could really drill into. Yes. And that kind of is my point, too, Mary, is that, you know, if, if, if I were to say, oh, this is a very interesting topic, this, this debate within the deaf community, I want to write a book about that. That's something I would not do just because it's, it's, it's centering an exper- a lived experience that I don't have. But if I'm going to write about this girl who is, who is deaf and it happens to be part of her, her characterization and such, um, I thought, okay. Well, at first I thought, I'm just going to make her hearing. But as we all know, sometimes our characters come to us in a certain way. and It's very difficult to imagine them in a different way. And it felt wrong to take that away from her, you know, in the sense, I mean, I'm speaking to other writers, so I know you know what I mean, but <laughs> just didn't, she wasn't the same character if, if I tried to do that. And I didn't want to not do it just because, well, I, I, I decided to continue on with Valencia as she was, but I also did a lot of due diligence. So you hesitated, right? You wondered if it was worth forging ahead. Um, and I think that you're your point to catch it before it slips away is that this this idea of standards is completely valid if we do choose to step outside of our lived experience writers everywhere need to be aware that they're going to be examined for their choices and like you said rightfully so that's kind of where it comes down for me. I say, well, you can, you can make the choices that you're making, but know that we live in a feedback loop where people will get on social media and they will examine what you're doing and people will have, like these waters are not very calm waters. People will have an opinion. So you, you examined your choice. You thought about not doing it. Um, and then you decided to forge ahead with Valencia and you, you were thinking, okay, but I need to do this intentionally. I need to do this, uh, with research and with due diligence. So what did that look like? So it looked like, um, first of all, you know, I had to not think of her as my deaf character in my book. I had to think of her as Valencia, who is deaf and is also very many other things. Willful, stubborn, independent, kind, you know, all these things. And I also knew that if I was going to do this, I would have to confront every stereotype and misconception that I had. And I think this is the step where, where people 
people fall behind often. We all think we're very open-minded, great people. <laughs> Nobody sits there and thinks, boy, I'm a real jerk. You know what I mean? Like, uh, we all think that we are progressive-minded people. But all of us have stereotypes and misconceptions, and you have to be willing to confront them. And so what I did was, first of all, I reached out to the American Society for Deaf Children. I reached out to Gallaudet University, which is the uh, deaf university in Washington, D.C. I reached out to the Deaf Hearing Communication Center in Swarthmore, near where I live. I enrolled in sign language classes. Uh, even though Valencia does not use sign language, by the way, but still, it, it's part, you know, I want a, as much information as I can get. Um, and I also connected with Gina Oliva, who is an author who has written books about, uh, she's deaf and she's written um, many books about her experience. I reached out to her. I met her. Um, she read the manuscript. Uh, someone at Gallaudet read the manuscript. Harper sent the manuscript to someone. So it went through all these, you know, first I had to write it for them to be able to read it, obviously. And to write it, I had to do all the due diligence that we're talking about. And so, and I had to be willing to ask Gina. I mean, you know, thanks. So fortunate to have Gina who was willing to answer any of my questions. Even the ones that made me look, you know, potentially stupid or under-informed, which I was under-informed, by the way. Um, so... You know, I had to do all that to even start to write her story. That's a high bar, I would say, that you held yourself to. Um, classes, even even the sign language classes that, that were not directly relevant. Um, you had several layers of feedback from people within the community that could speak to that lived experience, uh, both from your publisher and uh, that you that you searched for independently. Did you, at that point, did you feel prepared? I felt prepared and I felt um, as confident as, a, as any writer does <laughs> when they write a book. Um, but I was still um, nervous. And, I, and when the book came out and I was still waiting to see what the reception would be. And luckily it was embraced. And um, and of course, that made me very happy. But I think, had I not done all those things and been over prepared, you know, I think I think sometimes we think, oh, research. I'll just do a Google search. Um, but that's not even close to being enough. You have to go out and talk to, you know, you have to talk to people face to face. You have to ask questions that might make you look ill-informed or. Um, you know, you have to be willing to know what, what your own stereotypes are. And another thing that, that I often wonder about, about uh, writers is sometimes I feel like we're compelled to write other people's experiences because we, we don't necessarily look inward and value our own lived experience that we already have. Um, and what I mean by that is, you know, before my first book came out, a lot of a lot of the books that I was writing had white characters who were looked like the characters that I grew up reading. And at, at some point I thought, you know, maybe I should write about what I what I actually know as a Filipino girl growing up in the South and write about that. You know, and I think I think sometimes writers forget to do that. We forget to use our own ourselves as resources. You know, I, you know, I don't know if it's because we, we don't see our own lived experience as interesting enough as other people's lived experience. Sometimes we skip that, that step as well, if that makes any sense. It does. And, and I think one of the, one of the points that you're making that has, has sort of uh, lit up social media and the, the cultural discourse right now is this rigorous honesty and rigorous inner work. Um, that that some people are afraid to do or some people feel that they don't have to do. Um, because I, I think you're right. We, we all tend to have a pretty, pretty level-headed uh, summation of ourselves and how we're doing. We tend to feel like, hey, we're doing pretty well. Um, but what I hear you saying is that really poking around at every assumption 
at your intentions, at what you're hoping to get out of telling a particular story, that's a huge piece of it before the research part even kicks in. Yes, definitely. And I think, I think where it gets dicey and where it gets very tricky is, you know, everyone's lived experience is very, very nuanced. So if you're centering an experience that you're not familiar with, it's very easy to miss those nuances um, of, of what it means to live every single day within the shoes of, you know, fill in the blank uh, community. Um, you know, my, my lived experience every single day as a, as a woman or as a Filipino woman or as a woman in the South or whatever it may be is going to be very different than someone else's lived experience every day. And there's all these nuances. So I think it comes down to from a craft level as writers, um, you're kind of at a disadvantage when you're writing outside your lived experience. If you're centering someone else's lived experience, you're at a dif disadvantage craft wise because it can be difficult to create truly textured three-dimensional characters because you don't have access to those nuances of what it means to live that life every day. But then on the other side, apart from craft, just from the, the question, the big question that we're asking, like who's allowed to write what stories, you're being held to this high accountability that's difficult to achieve. Because, not because of ill intention, but just because there's a lot of things that, that we miss if we don't, if we haven't lived that every day, if that makes sense. This, this calls to mind, so for the Good Story podcast, I interviewed middle grade writer Jake Burt, who is white, and he had this manuscript where he uh, had decided he was setting it in Southern California. He decided to make his protagonist Hispanic. And um, then he kind of got a few kickbacks from his publisher in terms of feedback from the sensitivity reader. And he did a lot of soul searching. You know, he hit the pause button. Um, and he did an experiment in that he removed all of the details that pertain to the character's culture. And this was a protagonist. I was going to ask you about kind of protagonist versus secondary characters. Um, and it took him three hours to remove everything that sort of spoke to that piece of the protagonist. And he decided to recast it as a white protagonist. Um, I think in part because he he realized that some of these details, that texture that you're talking about, um, that isn't necessarily surface level. Um, in in his manuscript, it had come across as potentially kind of superficial. If he was able to get rid of it that easily, he decided, well, that that makes the decision for me. Yes. Uh, to speak to kind of that level and depth of detail and just insight that somebody going outside of their lane may not naturally have. Yeah. And you know what? One thing that um, I always ask my students is, and this is good whether you're writing in your lane or outside your lane or whatever, is why are you writing this story and why does it have to be you? In other words, what is, why did the character, for example, and I'm sure they asked him this, you know, why is the character Hispanic? And, and if, the, if the answer is, oh, because I need a diverse cast, that's not an answer, right? Uh, um, there needs to be something or some reason why you're the one to tell the story, right? So, um, trying to think of some good examples here. Okay. Um, Whenever we write our characters, and I'm very much a character-driven author, all my books start with character and everything I do comes from character. Um, what is it like to be, for example, I'll use my own book for an example. So my first book, Blackbird Fly, is about a girl who's 12 and she's Filipino and she's growing up in the South, in South Louisiana, where uh, in a very homogenous community and she's the only Asian at her school. Um, and she finds out that she's on the, the list of the ugliest girls in school. She finds out she's number three on this list. And the book is very much about her, you know, as middle grade often is reclaiming her, her identity and learning to be proud of who she is. Um, it would be very difficult, right, for someone who was not a 12-year-old girl, Filipino girl in, South Louis in a small town in South Louisiana to write that book, right? Because... There were so many levels to 
not just the overt racism that Apple, the main character, experiences that most of us can recognize. Most of us recognize overt racism, right? We all know what that is. It's the covert, the nuanced racism that Apple experiences um, that provides the layers that a story needs to truly be authentic. And if you have not lived uh, that nuanced experience, you may not be as familiar with the covert, the microaggressions, right? The microaggressions that someone in a marginalized community experiences every day. You're just not going to be familiar with it. And, you know, you won't be familiar with the foods or the way uh, Apple's mother would speak to her or the cultural, what it feels like to be uh, culturally distant from your parents. And what is it like when you have a parent who, whose idea of raising you is completely different than the, quote, American way of raising kids, you know? It's all those things that make our characters authentic and create characters that readers identify with across, you know, ethnicity and race and religion and all that stuff. And it's when you don't have access to all those layers, it can be difficult to manufacture them. And it can be even difficult to say, you know, if, let's say someone wanted to write a book about a 12-year-old Filipino girl in South Louisiana, and they decide to interview me as their research, right? Yeah. How am I going to explain? <laughs> okay, this is what it's like every day when you're walking around. There's things that, that I wouldn't even be aware of to tell someone. And there's things that we're not even aware of until we start writing. You know, and for me, write what you know very much means write your emotional truth. And our identities, all our various identities that we have, racial identity, ethnic identity, personhood identity, sexual orientation, all that stuff, um, informs that emotional truth and, and resonance. So, you know, it's, it's all connected. I don't know if that answered your question, but... I think just just those examples, especially, you know, coming from a different culture, well, what's it like to be an Americanized kid or a kid growing up in America, but also having uh, one foot in the home culture and the heritage, uh, you know, th there's a lot there that you're completely right. No matter how diligent our research you wouldn't be able to communicate all of those layers necessarily in an hour long interview or in a sensitivity reader report. Yes, definitely. And that's, and that's why I feel like it's different with the protagonist versus secondary characters and why it was important for me that even though Valencia is outside my lived experience. And of course, even our secondary characters have to be completely authentic. I, I would never purport to write a book about, what is it like to, for Valencia to be mainstreamed in school every day? Or what is it like for Valencia to live with her parents every day? Although there are scenes with her parents, it's not the heart, the meat of the book. And I would never want to set out to write that book because I know that I'm not the person to write that book. So you, know? to you, you felt confident or confident enough, you know, like you said, uh, as if writers ever feel 100% confident. Um, you felt confident enough in Valencia as a secondary character where her experience being deaf is not the main quote unquote point or quote unquote issue in the book. It's not necessarily the, the driver of the story. Um, you felt confident enough with her as a secondary character. Whereas if, if the story was her story, um, as a protagonist, you would not, that's not what you would have written. No, I feel like that would have been a very, I would not have been comfortable writing, you know, about that and about all the, all the, um, e even going near the controversy within the deaf community like, that you spoke of earlier, or, or even dipping my toe in that. I don't feel like, um, I, I would not have written that book. No. So and same with Kaori, because Kaori is Japanese American, yeah. um, but that's not really what the book is about. You know, it's not about her being Japanese American. It is a lot about Virgil being Filipino and living in a Filipino household. Yeah, but that's. But I can write about that, right? Because I understand that what that looks like. So going back to um, this idea of the the diverse cast for the sake of diversity. Um, so let's say we have a white writer 
Um, and for the reasons that you mentioned, they've decided because of their lived experience to make their protagonist white. But um, that being said, I think it would be a huge disservice to a book, especially one for young readers, to not represent a diverse cast in the book. Um, because that's just not the world that we live in, right? And, and, and we want a kid of color or a kid coming from a different lived experience to come to the page and recognize somebody on that page. Um, and so the white writer thinks, you know, not to, not to seem mercenary or it seem too gross about it, but I do think that there is a cultural awareness that, gosh, I, I, I should include a diverse cast one way or another in my book, especially as a white writer. I, I've heard that concern from many, many, many white writer clients who say, okay, I do want to make my book diverse, but I don't want to make it diverse in a way that feels like I'm checking boxes. That's kind of a tough place to be in when we think about how to thoughtfully diversify, if you will, a cast of characters to best reflect the world that we live in. How does a writer even begin approaching making those decisions? That is uh, very tricky. So, um, if you can and I will be <laughs> floundering through that question. Yeah, it's even difficult to, to figure out the, the questions, much less the answers. But um, so this is what I think. I think um, because, because characters are so important to me, um, I'm, I'm coming at this from a perspective of a very character-driven author. And one thing I've, I've learned over the years is that everyone writes their stories differently. So if you're a plot-driven author and you think of a great plot and then you populate it with characters, your mind, I can tell you right now, works totally differently from mine. <laughs> so um, everything for me comes from characters first. And so I spend months, um, and I can only answer this question from my perspective, and hopefully you can glean that's some why, of That's why you're here. <laughs> yes. So I spend, my process is I spend months thinking of my characters. I usually start with one character. Usually one character comes into my head and he or she just refuses to go anywhere. So I keep staying with that character. And from that character comes a story. And from that story comes other characters. And this process is months in my brain before I ever write anything down. I, I never come up with an idea and think, oh, I'm gonna write that down. Or I wake up in the morning and say, I'm going to write that down. I never do that. I always let it percolate in my head. And then after months and months, once I, f I have this, this very three-dimensional story in my brain, then I sit down and write a synopsis. And everything that's been in my brain, I put down on a piece of paper in a synopsis. So what that has to do with story is, I mean, characters, is... The way I approach characters is whenever they're in my head and they're populating the world and they come up three-dimensionally in my brain, they arrive how they arrive. And because of the way my brain works, they will arrive in, they may arrive deaf, they may arrive um, Hispanic, they may arrive, however they arrive in my brain is how they arrive. Because I'm already... Um, I don't know how to say this without making it sound like I'm so woke. Um, <laughs> I, <laughs> I'm already astutely aware. <laughs> yeah. I'm done. You, no, I'm just you kidding. You're in the real world and then your right. imagination is populated the way the world is. My imagination is populated by the way I see the world. And my world has, I have diverse uh, friend groups. I have, I've worked in diverse workplaces. I live in diverse neighborhoods. So the characters come to me as they come as the real world reflects. Now, that being said, I'm working on a book right now that takes place in a very, very small town. There's only 12 seventh graders in the whole school um, on the bayous of Louisiana. And all those characters, I can tell you, arrived at me white because <laughs> in this small town, it's not, trust me, it's not going to be like diversity. You know what I mean? It's going to be a homogenous community. 
So sometimes they arrive homogenous if that's what the setting called for. But um, one thing with Hello Universe was, I, you know, I'd cert- I definitely didn't sit there and think, you know what, I should have a deaf character and I should also have a Japanese character and then I'll have a white character. I don't do that. So they, they came, however they're in the book is how they arrived in my brain. So it's hard for me to, to think about how to diversify a cast because that's, that's just on how my brain works. So I don't even know if I was helpful in any way. No, I, I mean, I, I have to keep asking this question because I get it so much. And I think that the, the kind of uh, the extension of this stay in your lane idea could be that we end up sometimes underrepresenting a diverse cast. You know, if people are, um, only staying in their lane, right? That's not reflective of reality. And that does a disservice to readers who may not find themselves represented on pages. I'm, I'm talking about white writers specifically. And so, but at the same time, I do see manuscripts where we have a very ethnic name, for example, and it seems like the writer is like, okay, I did it. <laughs> you know, I, uh, I sort of diversified the cast, but there's got to be more to it, you know? And it's got to be to like, this is another thing, Mary, that's important to me that I see a lot in manuscripts that I make notes on all the time is too often writers think of their, their books as like the stage and their characters are the chess pieces that they're moving around the chessboard to make them do what they want. And the problem is, Writers, time and time again, I, I see this in so many manuscripts that I read. Um, the characters are moving from here to there, but it doesn't feel like I'm embodying the scene in any real way. Like, I'm not, I'm not walking around in this character's shoes. And I think the problem is writers, as writers, we're thinking of, okay, this is my plot, and I have to get my character to do A, B, and C, and that's what they're going to do in this chapter. They don't think about what's it actually like to be character Mary Cole in this cafeteria in eighth grade, sitting by herself at lunch. Sorry, no, I, just, I just put you all by yourself at lunch. <laughs> <laughs> like, what does that actually feel like in a very real way? You know, and it's about being a storyteller and not a reporter. And I think too many manuscripts are like reporting events, but you're not telling me a story. You know, I mean, I've read manuscripts that are in first person. It's 50,000 words. And even though it's in first person, there's no voice. I don't know what it's like to be this character, even though I've been in first person with this character that's 50,000 words. I still don't know what they actually feel or think. I see them doing things. And you I think- brought up so many things, Erin. I <laughs> hate to interrupt you, but I think the, the interesting thing here is that you feel like some writers have an agenda and sort of at whatever cost sort of stamp that agenda over the characters. Yes. It it sounds like you from everything, you haven't even talked about your process really all that much, but it sounds like uh, from everything I've heard today so far, you sort of just show up and listen for these people to tell you who they are. They sort of plop out fully formed. Um, and you sort of, you take, uh, you take a bit of more of a back seat. It, would that be accurate? Yes, totally accurate. In fact, that's why I don't write anything down for many months because the moment I write it down, I've taken agency over the story already. So I don't write anything down until I'm ready to put the things on paper. But first, I have to know what to put on paper. So one question I get a lot is, well, what if you forget something? And, uh, and maybe this is not a good answer, but I just say, if I, if I forget it, it wasn't worth remembering. Because I remember the important stuff about my characters that they, you know what I mean? It, just yeah. like if I met someone and they said, and they tell me, um, you know, my husband died last year and I planted a tomato garden. Well, I might forget the tomato garden, but I'm not going to forget the important thing that they told me, right? You know, I'm going to remember the stuff that, that matters at the end of the day, in my view. So I feel like if, if, if writers took that approach where they actually envision and embody scenes through their character's eyes, I think once you do that, this tokenizing of characters um, 
becomes, you become less uh, inclined to say, oh, I'm going to plop a black character here and I'm going to plop, I'm going to have my uh, Hispanic character over here because you're not thinking of them in that way. If, you, if your brain is thinking it through your characters, you're viewing the world as your character and, the, and they, won't, they won't appear as tokenized cardboard cutouts. They'll appear as three-dimensional humans, you know, or creatures or whatever they are in your book. <laughs> um, we forget that, that they're supposed to be flesh and blood beings that we're writing about. They're not just words on paper, right? The goal is to make them real. So I think a big takeaway from this whole thing on topic and not would be to just shut up and listen rather than, you know, because I think earlier we were talking about, you know, so many people think that they have an understanding. So many people think that they're at a certain level. Maybe they're not. Maybe we open ourselves up to the idea that we don't know everything going into the character creation process, even about the character, regardless of, you know, race, gender identity, all of that. But yes. all these other details of character, we could just listen yes. <laughs> a little bit more as, as we're getting to know them. Yes. And, and that goes for the, actually, that goes for ourselves and the industry itself. You know, if, if you're someone who, you know, I think a lot of people approach this cancel culture, as it's been called, or, mm -hmm. or this, um, oh, well, we should be able to write whatever we want. If you come at the, the issue with that defensive nature, instead of listening and actually reading what people are actually saying and thinking about it, you've already, you've already messed up, kind of, because <laughs> <laughs> uh, it's about forgetting, don't get defensive, forget about all that stuff. Just actually listen to what people are saying and maybe you'll learn something. It's very hard to learn when you're, when you're on the defensive, right? Cause you don't want to listen. And that's what I think is, you know, I, I, uh, I've heard it said, uh, whether it was on social media or NPR, or, you know, every time that we touch this topic, it's so incendiary because the, immediate assumption is, oh, I'm being called racist or I'm being called, you know, I'm being called one of these ist um, derogatory words if, if, if I don't do exactly the right thing. And I think that that can shut down a lot of this inquiry that you're advocating for and this humility that you're advocating for. Like you said, defensiveness sort of, you're, you've already lost when that's the that's the mode you're coming from but it's it's almost hard not to because people as we keep coming back to this idea people like to think highly of themselves as they should <laughs> but maybe this this position of knowing can really get in the way yes definitely you know instead of instead of being angry and saying i'm not racist uh instead of going there maybe stop and think Okay, what did I say and why, why did that person, why was it taken that way? You know, and I think it's also important to know that, that um, it's not on us to tell someone else when they can or cannot be offended by something, especially if we're not part of the community that they're a part of. So um, I think that's an important part of it as well. Like, oh, why are you getting offended? That's, that's not what that person meant. Well, you know, and I mean, it's, it's, it's not up to us to, to decide this this should offend you and this should not offend you yeah per person in another community <laughs> i mean like <laughs> that's not how it should go ever so i think to 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 really address this thoughtfully and to um to sort of participate again thoughtfully in this publishing culture in our larger culture in our society today i think just this this idea of inquiry um and uh, self-awareness and just, just trying to examine ourselves, examine the world and uh, do better and be better, basically. <laughs> yes, and, and, and read books outside of your community as well, written by authors from that community, especially if you're, gonna, if you're thinking about writing a book, you know, outside your lane, so to speak. You definitely should be aware of the writers that are actually in that lane, writing books about that community. I think that's important as well. Um, so, yeah, definitely. To point, one last general question, and then we'll turn it over to the group. 
but um, what do you make of this, this position that if we do, however, as white writers or writers in the dominant culture, if we do represent a character outside of our lived experience, whether race um, or uh, gender identity or anything like that, uh, that we take potentially a spot from an underrepresented writer from telling that story? I know this goes back to the much bigger question, but do you, do you think that do you think it's an either or situation in the larger publishing landscape right now? You know, I think, um, oh boy, that's a complicated one as well. <laughs> I, <laughs> Here, here's the thing that, that I, that I would urge writers to think about with no matter what book they're writing, it all goes back to the question of why are you writing this book yeah. and why are you the one to write it? So I say that to say, um, let's say I, I, write a, I decide to write a story about a trans character, and I am not trans, I'm cisgender, and you ask me why am I writing this, and I tell you, well, my best friend is trans, and, and I, I, it hurts me to see what he goes through, and I want to write a story that shows you know, all these wrongs and exposes it. Okay, that's a noble cause. But then the second question is, why are you the person to write it? Why, why are you Aaron? And I would not have an answer for that question mm -hmm. because the truth is there are many other writers who could and would write that story um, better with more authenticity, with more nuance, with more respect to the community. Um, writers who are within that community. So I, I, I don't necessarily think of it as taking up a spot, although I definitely, there's an argument that can certainly be made for that. I think of it like, even before you even write the book, you have to be able to answer those two questions. Can someone write it better than you? And if the answer is yes, I mean, as writers, we all think someone can write anything better than us, but <laughs> if someone can write this story better than you, you know, with, with, more, with more authority and more honesty, then maybe they're the ones who should be writing it and you should be writing your own truths. So that's how I think of it. Thank you for fielding some really complex, uh, nuanced and, and honestly difficult questions for us. Thank uh, you. It was a lot of fun. So happy you. writing, Thank everyone. You.